Today we're at the Grand Island Veterans Home in Grand Island, Nebraska. My name's Larry Molchek. I'm with Richard Stanley Barnett, who is a resident here at the Grand Island Veterans Home. I work here at the home. Mr. Barnett was born on February 26, 1925. He was in the Army and served uh, from June 11, 1943 to October 11, 1945. His highest rank was Staff Sergeant. He was in Squadron B, 2523 AAF BU, HAAF Hondo, Texas. He was in the World War II conflict, served in England, also in Germany and France during that time. And Mr. Barnett, can you tell me a little bit about what your life was like when you were growing up? Where, where were you born? Uh, well, I was born in, uh, in Broomfield, Colorado, and my folks moved to Missouri. I think I was about four years old, and my brother and sister, and uh, they started farming at an old uncle's farm, and uh, they continued through that as we went through elementary school and then in high school, and they moved in several uh, different times. Farmers always moved on uh, March 1st of every year, of their year they're going to move. And uh, that always interfered with the schooling. And so on my last year of high school, my family moved into a on a farm with an adjoining, from an adjoining school district. And uh, I was in that school from March 1st until about, about May, about June 1st. And when it came time for graduation, they said they didn't have time to get the, everything done, so I didn't get a diploma. But the next day or two, I got a letter from the, uh, uh, county association tell me they were like me to go to service and so I went to Leavenworth, Kansas on May the 11th of 43 and uh, when I got there of course I was uh, a new person in the nine and I had a toe off my large big toe on my right foot was off due to the next thing my dad and I had. And I had a injury in my back, lumbar area, for falling off a tractor one time. And, but uh, when I got in the line for the induction, I went right through like I was 100% okay. And, uh, and uh, then of course, uh, they gave me clothing and found out that my one right foot was a different size than my left foot. So therefore they couldn't put the a GI shoe on me. So they put me back in the barracks in Leavenworth, Kansas and ordered shoes for me. And it took 90 days to get the shoes. And so I waited there the entire time, the entire time for my shoes to come before they sent me out to further training. I wanted to ask, you know, when the war broke out, um, oh. what, what plans did you have for your life before the war started? What did you want to do when you grew up? Uh, my my uh, family was strictly farm families, and uh, the only thing I knew was farming, and I was in uh, FFA in school, and of course that was to lead you into more farming if possible. And that's all I knew. And that's what, kind of what I thought I would do when I got that wonderful letter. So, uh, When you got the letter, did you have any choice over which branch of the service you went into? When I finally got to Leavenworth, they were uh, asking for everybody to tell them what, your, what you would like to do. And uh, uh, first of all, I didn't want to go to Asia and the South Pacific. And uh, 
Then they said, well, you got the choice of Navy or the Air Force. And I didn't like the Navy, so I said Air Force. And they said, good, you just volunteered for the Air Force. So at, at the time that you finally got out of your basic training, where did, where did you end up going originally after that? Uh, the, my basic training, I went to Leavenworth to uh, uh, t uh, Texas, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, for my basic training, and that was six weeks. It is, I, I didn't care much for that. And then they sent me to Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, for gunnery school, aerial gunnery school. And of course, I'd never much more than heard of the word uh, Las Vegas. So when I got there, I was it was a camp with tents, and we lived in tents uh, on the edge of, outside of town and started our gunnery training. And uh, the training started out as everybody kind of had seen the shoot a rifle at the ducks going across the, the stage down below you a little ways. You shoot at the ducks uh, going by. And after a little bit of time at that, we finally got to the 20, 12 gauge shotgun and everybody was uh, programmed to shoot the shotguns at different kinds of different kinds of uh, targets, and most all of them are moving targets. So they took uh, a, a way of aiming against the wind and taking time to hit the target. And one of the best targets we had was if you were in the back of a pickup truck and it had a kind of a rail around it and you stood there with your shotgun and peered out the front and as the truck got truck went down this uh, roadway uh, uh, somebody apparently was sitting on the ditch uh, shooting these plastic what do you call them ducks uh, uh, out in front of that, and it would go any any different direction. It might go in front of you, come around over your head, or back over you, whatever. And you were sitting there with your shotgun, and you would shoot at it or hit it if possible. And all all ammunition had uh, colors in it, so that your particular ammunition would show in what you hit. And and that, that that went on for some time. Later on in the combat situation, did you use shotguns that much? Why no. did they have you practice with a shotgun? I have no idea why we started with a shotgun. Uh, a little later after this kind of trip, uh, they had the regular uh, um, equipment that was taken out of an airplane that held guns normally ammunition, normally a machine gun type, uh, uh, 50 millimeters, something like that. And they had shotguns in there, in each one shotgun on each side of you. And then you shot using the, using the uh, equipment, you shot at targets that were moving down away from you on, uh, uh, like like uh, machinery in a railroad track, and all you saw was the canvas going by down in front of you, and again you had colored ammunition, and you fired using a shotgun. That went on for some time, and everybody's shoulders were sore from the shotgun, and ears sore from hearing it, and then they finally loaded us up the same equipment with a 50 gauge machine gun and a 50 caliber, I'm sorry, 50 caliber machine gun. And we shot the same way at targets. And when that was over with, uh, when they finished that, 
the, we got into the B-17, it was flying with the same machine guns and at targets, they were out against you. At, the targets were flying uh, out of this, sometimes a thousand feet away, okay? And we went through that until a certain, uh, we made so much progress and and uh, we were fully equipped then to get in the tr the final training and use a machine gun, which is supposed to make you ready for combat. You so, feel that it did a good job of doing that? A wonderful job, a wonderful job. Uh, like uh, most people probably like me, uh, the first day they put us in a B-17, we'd never seen one before, let us got in one. And here they give us this, the machine guns and the, uh, the turrets. And out, out away from us was a different, another aircraft. And it was pulling a sleeve, a white sleeve probably hooked on to it uh, five or six hundred feet away from it. A, co a cord was pulling that sleeve and we'd fire at that target. And of course, uh, there were different speeds. You had to uh, go regulate the speed and the, and the distance your gun before you hit the target. So this was all part of the training. And uh, I and when I got through with the training in Las Vegas, I was sent to uh, uh, Tampa, Florida, uh, as a uh, as a member, future member of a team that ran a, uh, in an airplane. And so I went to a place called Plant Park in Florida, and that's where the uh, apparently a lot of the ba baseball uh, people were doing this winter training and uh, in Plant Park I got to know tar the, uh, Tampa pretty well. I was there quite a while, probably, probably uh, uh, four to six weeks and uh, one day uh, my name was called to meet at a certain place in the park there. A number of some uh, kind of a number to uh, everybody met at certain numbers. And it was my crew. I was one of 10 people that would be on this crew. And uh, it would be 17. And uh, his name after we got there, the, I met the pilot, the co-pilot, and all the people, and uh, uh, everybody had a particular job that they were supposed to take, and uh, mine was ball turret gunner under the B-17 because of my size. I was smaller than anybody else there, and, and besides that, I was younger, and. Uh, we uh, then all then we all well, finally, after being there and getting organized about who was who, we were sent to our training base in uh, Florida, and uh, we were. And I should tell you who my pilot. My pilot was named Ray Hieronymus, and uh, I think he was Greek, but he never really told us. And uh, we had a co-pilot of Glenn Peavy from our, from Georgia. Uh, Hieronymus was from uh, Washington, D.C. Peavy was from G Georgia. And a, uh, a navigator was from Arizona. And uh, his name was Geis. And the bombardier was Scar, S-C-A-R. He said he was from, uh, uh, in Africa someplace. 
he was a uh, he was a uh, very nice looking fellow and just a little bit tan not not really not really tan but just a little bit tan and my uh the uh co-pilot or the uh engineer of the plane was from New Jersey and he was a tech sergeant and uh radio operator was from Tennessee, Bill, uh, Bill Terry, and my uh, bombardier, my uh, tail gunner, was six foot, real tall guy from South, uh, South Carolina. And he was a tail, gun, tail gunner and had almost lay down because he's so tall. And uh, then eventually we were sent to Avon Park, Florida uh, is that enough about the pilot I've... Yeah, I, was, I was kind of wondering that, uh, so you, you're on this crew here, did you have the plane they trained you on, was it the same one you ended up actually flying on when you got overseas? No, when when we left Tampa, Florida and went to Avon Park, Florida to, to do our training in the 17, they were all old worn out 17s. Probably some of them might have even been, even been brought back from combat, it's, it was hard to tell. But they were old equipment, uh, probably uh, a B, C, and D uh, models, and we flew a G in combat. So that was the difference in probably some of the equipment. And uh, it was bad, it wasn't, wasn't very good around in uh, Avon Park, Florida, it was more mosquitoes than anything else, but we made it all right. And uh, we left Avon Park, Florida in a new 17. Pardon me, I shouldn't be. We left Avon Park, Florida and went to Hunterfield, Georgia and got a new 17 there to fly overseas. And uh, Otherwise, we'd have had to take the boat to go over there or something like that. So I thought it was real nice that we flew. But we took off from Hunterfield, Georgia. And my pilot was from uh, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> so we were on our way to uh, North, to uh, New Hampshire to spend the night. So to get to New Hampshire, we flew across Washington, D.C. and he pointed out the little things about what he knew about Washington, D.C. Then we went to New York City and flew across New York City and we saw the Statue of Liberty and so forth. Today, you couldn't possibly do anything like that. But at that time, it was so odd. That first time I ever saw Washington, D.C. or the Statue of Liberty, but I was real amazed to see such a thing. And then by nightfall, we were in Grenier Field, New Hampshire, where we had spent the night and the plane was was uh, lubricated one thing or another. And the next night, we went north. The next night, we were in uh, 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 can't they? just outside of, in the, in up, the up north part of Canada. Uh, and we spent a night there where they, it was the last, it was the last uh, American uh, unit. And they were without, at that time they were without food, or basically without food because the ship hadn't come in. And uh, the next night, we were in uh, New, New uh, uh, Iceland, and uh, whatever the name of that town was, it, it's got it started with an R. It's got a whole bunch of letters to it, and uh, the letter, the label, the day was adorable. It was all daylight, and uh, they had walkways built around the camp and around the town that had 50-gallon uh, barrels, 
filled with rocks and then cables hooked the barrels together so that you had something to hold on to where he's walking in the wind. It wasn't very nice. And I don't remember seeing any adult people there with teeth. They had some kind of teeth, but most of them were all uh, brown, yellow, and almost gone. Uh, apparently they their diet or something didn't allow them to have much uh, mineral and so forth on their, for their teeth. And uh, I remember seeing one plane come in there, coming back for the United States, and it had a, a number of, of uh, nurses on it, and the rest of it, the plane was filled with wounded people coming back to the States. And that was quite uh, quite a thing for us to see. Uh, there was actually people that had been in combat and were injured in coming back. And uh, the, next, the next day we take off and fly to, uh, we're, we're on our way to uh, Ireland and uh, it's, uh, that's quite something to see nothing but water again. I hadn't seen anything like this in my life. And it's just water, water, water. And when we finally get to the, uh, the coast of Ireland, we receive the landing spot. And I've heard of this one time, uh, two or three years ago, it was Nuts Corner, Ireland. Nuts Corner, I don't know. I never thought there would be such a place, but there is. That's a true place. And we put the airplane in there and left it. And we spent the night and the next day in Ireland. And we could see, we got to see the people that left, lived in the house with the cattle on the dinner floor and different things like that. Real, it was it's thing you'd heard of but never seen. And they gave us, we all had, if we had any money, they would give us Irish money if we wanted it. And of course, all of us had to get at least a dollar. And it was about the size of a, uh, a page out of your notebook and the different colors. But it was, it was a, something to, re, to see all this. And the next day, we they got us on a put us on a boat. We went from Ireland to Liverpool, England, and uh, it was a real, really rough flight. Or rough, rough in the seas. It was so windy and cold. And from uh, from Ireland and uh, from Liverpool, we went across. England in a train and it was real hard to see their kind of trains at that time and we wound up at DIS, D-I-S-C, England and as far as I'm concerned it was in the uh, county of, Eng county of uh, uh, Lincoln County, Lincolnshire, England, and it was a very poor part of England. The people had uh, just absolutely nothing. And from from Dish, we took a, uh, they give a, 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 a truck ride to the base, which is probably five or six miles from Dish. And it was in a place called uh, Abbott's Corner. And Abbott's Corner was a, a place of a little church and four or five or six little houses. And everybody's farm was in like a, like a piece of pie from their house. And that was the way the thing, the people lived there were farm people and they had their livestock 
and so forth. And uh, that that way their houses were all basically together. And I think they had some probably freedom there. Probably uh, there wasn't as much uh, uh, stealing or unfriendly things that would go on because the houses were all right together. And our base was built right on the side of that. And uh, when when we when we got to Ireland, to start with, we didn't know where we were going. We was pretty sure that this B-17 would only fly high altitude, heavy missions, but we didn't know where they might go. So the word come out after we got to Ireland that we were going to a place called uh, the 100th Bomb Group in the 8th Air Force. And uh, the more we heard of the 100th Bomb Group, we knew it was a suicide base <laughs> of uh, the whole 8th Air Force. It wasn't that bad, but it was, it did have the name of being the, the bloody 100th. So as we got there, we were assigned a new plane, a different plane. It wasn't a new one, but a different plane. And uh, they put, it, put us on a little bit of missions over England, or flights over England, so we got a, uh, we could see the territory and kind of learn what it looked like. And we did that for two or three days. And then we had we were assigned our first our first mission, and uh, it was a, a kind of a late day run, and it was a, a utility uh, oil oil uh, oil tanks in in France, and uh, here we were, boy, we were seeing all this new country and. Just 100% looking everything over and bombed the oil field, and I think the tanks were empty. And we didn't see any com any fighter planes. We didn't get any. Uh, we didn't get any uh, fire fire from anything. And we come back to the base and thought, well, this is going to be a pretty good deal. Uh, so anyway. The first mission. It was after it was after uh, B uh, D Day because we didn't get there in time for D Day, so it would have been probably right at the first day of July. And uh, July, I'm changing the first day of August that we'd take our flight, and we had several flights after that of all different things that could happen. And we got lots of training on anti-aircraft and, and enemy fighters. And we got to know kind of what we were doing pretty surely. And then we come the day, the 11th day of September, and uh, we were all, we got out of I think they got us out at about two o'clock in the morning and gave us some kind of a food, you know, to had to mess off and into the uh, training, the, re, me, the mission room where they gave out all the information that was gonna happen. And here's a big screen at the end of the room, at the back side of the room, and a, and a flight, a, a map of, uh, all of Germany and probably all of France, a, a big map going across. And on that map is a red ribbon about so wide and it goes up and down and up and down and over here is a target and then the, the thing comes back and shows you how you get back on this map. 
so we that was our that was the 11th day of September of 1944 and it was our 13th mission so uh everybody was kind of happy that we called we started calling it B B12 we didn't like 13 so we called it B12 and it was in Czechoslovakia, which we had never been to before. So we're, uh, so we're flying. Uh, there was 12 planes in our, in our squadron. There was 13 planes in our squadron and we were number 13. And our pilots were, were actually good pilots and they were, they were to fly one just above the lead plane. And the lead plane was the colonel or whoever was taking care of the mission. And we were flying above the lead plane. Then if any happened thing happened to the lead plane, we took care of it. We took over the position. Or if it, that, it was, something else went wrong, we would go back and catch that plane's position. So long in the mission after we got pretty well in the, toward Czechoslovakia, the 12th plane had something happen, he dropped out of formation. And so our plane had to go down and take the number 12 position. That was a low plane of the 12. I was underneath of that plane so was, I could see the ground better than anybody else could see, but I couldn't see anything above me. So we get into this this uh, bomb run, and we get to the place of what's called the IP, IP, where they start getting ready to make the final run on the target. And the target was an oil refinery in Czechoslovakia. Rulin, it was called Rulin. And we got uh, the Bombay doors open, everything on set, and we got attacked from the back, out of the sky, uh, 40 enemy planes in two different groups come down on the back side of us like that, and then onto the back and they blew the planes out of the sky. Uh, it was bad. I was down underneath everything, so I couldn't see those planes until they come through and went underneath of us, then I could see them. And I could see either our planes in trouble, falling and in trouble one thing or another, only after they'd got below our our plane, where I could see them. And then all of a sudden, I can't hardly move. And there's a, uh, I couldn't tell what's happening, but our plane was hit severely and, and spun in what's called a flat, flat spin. The plane was still uh, like it was flying normal but it's going around and around and around and dropping due to what the, tar the, what the, the damage had been done to the plane. When that plane's going like that, I've got a force against me that I can't hardly move. So anyway, to the pilots get that plane out of, they, they break up the, spin it in about 10,000 feet and get it to flying normal. And by this time, uh, the damage has been done. We still have a full bomb load on. So uh, the I could see the, by looking back through my uh, tail, by my ball turret to the tail of the plane underneath of it, I could see a pair of shoes hanging out the back window. <laughs> big, uh, 
back uh, door. And uh, I hollered on the mic for this guy to get back in because I couldn't get out. And uh, he could get me out. And uh, thank goodness it happened that way. And he came up forward then and turned the apparatus by his hands, fingers, to get my, my turret so I could lift out of it. And when we get that done, uh, the plane was flying about halfway sideways because most of the damage was done to the right wing and the right side of the tail and the whole inner fuselage area. And the, the boy, but the boy that was in the fuselage, the man, man, the guns there had taken a 20 millimeter hit and it tore up his arms and his legs and he was in kind of real bad shape. My shoes were laying out there in my turret. I couldn't have shoes on or a helmet or anything because it's too small. I was sitting down there and when I got out of the turret, my shoes had tore up, my uh, parachute was tore up, and this guy was laying here. And so one guy had already bailed out, and the pilot gives orders back to get ready to, to leave the plane because they could hardly keep it flying. And it uh, come pretty soon, uh, uh, who could jump and who couldn't jump. And they decided the fellow that was injured couldn't jump. Uh, somebody would have to help him. And I couldn't jump because I didn't have a parachute. So they decided that they would take the thing in as far as it would go. And they did a marvelous job of flying that machine without any navigation equipment or anything. And the only thing we had was four motors that still run. And uh, and uh, so they had that thing going. And it was shake so bad it was almost impossible to walk on it without walking it without hanging on to something. And we had to then get rid of all the weight that we could get rid of because the plane, plane was losing altitude. So we dropped all the bombs out. We, they, they were found a river. They found a river and we didn't know where we were or what the river was, but they were flying down this river and we dropped the bombs with the safeties in them in that river. And then all the ammunition and all the church materials, everything we could drop, we cut it out and dropped it out of the plane and dropped my ball turret out, which probably, I don't know what that weighed, but probably over a ton. And this helped them, this helped them get the plane, keep the plane flying. And we thought we were going for, for uh, uh, the Alps and across the Alps, but we never got that far. And we were going further to the south than we were to, yeah, toward the Alps. And so when they got to the place that uh, gasoline was just about gone, why they started looking for a place to put this plane down if we get it down. And we cranked it, we cranked the Bombay doors shut and we cranked the wheels down because there wasn't any electric, electricity. And they found a place that uh, they saw a pasture or a field and they made a circle, made a circle of that field and then came back against the wind 
and dropped into the plane into the uh, ground to the near the ground and when the plane lost lost flying speed of what little we had then there was much damage on the right side of the plane that the wind caught the plane when we were coming down and pulled it sideways and that's when it hit the ground the tires went into the soft soil and the wind cut us around and when the tires went into the soft soil it stopped the plane and it belted up on its nose and we broke the whole nose out of it and then it popped back down onto the ground and we got out of it and we had just gotten out of the plane when the place was surrounded with with people with guns and they had uh, uh, th there was no uh, army people or, or people with uniforms they were all uh, like people from town they all had certain kind of sh sh shirts and clothes on but they all had guns and they thought at first that we must be some kind of a German outfit and and we, and we couldn't speak very much French and uh, so they finally accepted us as um, as American and from there during the next few days we stayed in this little town and then took uh, flat, uh, took walked out of it uh, with people telling us where to go uh, that's about all about that. What, what country did you end up landing in? We landed, in, we landed on the French side. We landed on the French side of the German uh, border. It was just uh, uh, probably not a quarter of a mile in France. Was that an Allied hand at that point? Though? Yes. Uh, we, we went across uh, the, uh, the German uh, where the German had their, they had their uh, position, and we were in there crazy, but when we were in there, uh, run where they'd build up, build their tunnels, and build their walkways, and and uh, we didn't think we didn't think anything about there were maybe bombs in there or something, but uh, we didn't, had no problem. They had already left it. And uh, so I was, we went ahead, our injured man, they took our injured man to some hospital in France and apparently helped him. And we later saw him in, in England and then he later went to the United States. And he was the first of all of our crew, he was the first one that died uh, as of, we started out with 12 on your plane? We started out, we, when we, they manned us with 10. Okay. And then they took one of them away. They said that uh, in the, in the B-17, in the middle of it, there was, a, there was two windows, one window on either side and a gun on either side. And it was, wasn't proper. It wasn't, it wasn't possible for two guys to shoot guns at the same time because they'd be shooting at something over here and later something over here, but not at the same time. So when we got over there, they took one man off, put him in another fight where, where he was needed. So how many people stayed with the plane and were rescued in France? Okay. people had to bail out and what happened? Okay, uh, one man bailed out. The radio operator bailed out. He was uh, from Tennessee, Nashville. And he bailed out because he was scared to death. He was in a uh, the B-17 radio room was behind the, behind the bomb bay, but 
peel it off from the rest of the back of the plane. So when he got a 20 meter, 20 millimeter hit in his radio room, he thought everything was gone, so he bailed. And uh, later was in a POW, PW camp, and uh, he had broken his leg when he fell. But I think he made it back all right. The other man that was gone was the guy that got shot up, and we left him in France. So when we... Did he live? Yes, he lived and uh, went back to New York City. And uh, then that left seven of us uh, to get back off of the, from the plane on back. And when you say you got back, where did you have to travel back to to report back to? We, we walked back and caught one little bitty ride into France, into Paris. And we get we walked into Paris on the second day of the liberation, and uh, it was very noisy. Everybody was extremely happy, and we stayed there uh, until we could notify. Until they had France, uh, the army had people had. Uh, how a uh, business is set up where you could trans uh, phone out and and different things get, get out and tell where you were, and so they called our they called our base in England and said that we they had us there, and when they I don't know how long we were down waiting we waited two or three more days. And they sent a B-17, they sent a, a, a B, I know, the old, the old DC-3 after us. And it was a wreck to start with, but they put us on it on uh, the field there at Paris, and Orly Field, and took off. And we were so f afraid they wouldn't get off the ground because it had so many holes in it, where they they they'd set off bombs to make the make it impossible to use the runway, but they could still use it a little bit. And that little plane took us in the Heathrow Airport in London, outside London, and we went through customs there. And in customs, we had. We had picked up a, a carton of cognac from someplace in Paris and a little rifle and a pair and the, and the, uh, the people in the, in the uh, Heathrow took us, uh, took our cognac and took our rifle. And so everybody's going through uh, they're being in, interviewed individually on what had happened to us. And then I suppose somebody had listened to all our things and and could tell who was telling the truth and who wasn't maybe or whatever, or telling them more. And it came to me and I had some kind of a little piece of shoes on and uh, uh, an old, an old suit that I found on a plane that they had been, like a mechanic had used that suit and it had pop, pocket holes around it where they had uh, put uh, probably tools, one thing or another. And that was my get up for what I was wearing. And I didn't have any dog tags or uh, anything else, I didn't have any. So when I got to, into the customs, they want to know who I am and where's my identification. And I didn't have any, and that's kind of dumb. But when I go back a step, when we first got to England, 
something happened that I didn't, I lost my dog tags or I didn't have any more. So my first, my first mission we flew, I didn't have dog tags. And so with it being, that's got to mean something. So with every mission after that, I didn't, have, I didn't wear dog tags. So when I, So when I get to customs, he didn't like that very well. And so he said, well, how do they, we, we want, how do the base know who you are? You don't have any identification. And so my pilot says, tell him it's, tell him it's pale face. And uh, they'll know who he is, even though they wouldn't know his name. Not, uh, you know, just the people in the base. So, in a way, they sent a man, they sent a man to Heathrow to pick us up and take us back. And that's the way I got back to the base. And when I got to the base, of course, our, our commanding officer wanted to talk to me a little bit and where I had my dog tags and the thing that and when he got through ribbing me and carrying me out, chewing me up, he said, uh, Pale Fish, you did a pretty good job. <laughs> oh. I wanted to bring up uh, and we uh, stopped for just a few minutes here because the battery ran down on the oh. camera. Um you were going to talk about why they called you Pale Face. Do you have some Indian heritage or something? Uh, the, the deal with Pale Face was after we were assigned, the crew was assigned and they were going overseas, they decided it was time to have a party. And who, we didn't have very much money, so everybody put the dollar to the other they had and we got a bottle of whiskey. We were in Florida, so we went to a, a, a big hall that had a dance, open side, outside uh, uh, entertainment, and we had a, our, our bottle of whiskey, so everybody uh, had a drink. And when I first went into service, I learned to smoke and drink beer, but I never had any whiskey. So when we got our whiskey and this night out. I had my drink and then I disappeared. So they later found me someplace uh, laying in the ground, the grass, and I was white as a snowflake. And they called me Pale Face. So all the time since then, I was always Pale Face. And being my pilot's name was Hieronymus, and no one could pronounce it or spell it. A lot of times referred to the plane as Pale Face's crew. <laughs> so anyway, I got to know quite a bit about getting me called a name like that. And when I got home, eventually, I didn't let anybody know that. So they never ever knew that. And uh, because I didn't want anybody to know, I'd been called Pale Face. Now, uh, when we landed that plane, crew put that plane in in the France. There were certain pieces of equipment that had to be uh, exposed, of, disposed of, and they were the this uh, the uh, uh, pieces in machinery and the uh, bomb site and different things like that. And they all had uh, pieces of, of uh, dynamite or whatever you want to call it. And they pushed a button and it exploded the thing. The, the, the uh, sights were all exploded so that the site was still a site, but uh, it was all tore up. And uh, the other things that were dropped like that were dropped in the water in that river. 
But that when you took a plane in like that, you were supposed to dispose of everything that could, could be used. And that's what happened, which, and that's the way we took care of that. Uh, after being in, getting back to our base, uh, my tail gunner and I were usually together and uh, they gave us a week off or maybe more than that and we went to Southampton, Southampton, England, which is over near Liverpool. And it was a place that uh, the Red Cross had taken over. And a lot of the Red Cross was Canadian. And we went over there and then we got and had a nice time and came back. They started us, you're going to fly again. So the first day we were out to fly, uh, everybody's lined up to get ready to get on a plane, and our bombardier, and that fellow named Scar, got real sick, and they took him off the plane, and he never had to fly again. But the rest of us weren't quite that smart, so we flew, we had to fly again. and. I wanted to tell you about this. I, when we got back, the pilot and I got a distinguished flying cross. That's over here. And for him, for flying the plane and saving everybody, and for me, I don't know what all I did, but to give me the flying cross. The other side, is the air medal, and I got that air medal after putting in 300 combat hours. And when I finished flying, I had 330 combat hours. But uh, that was just two little things they did, they gave us. We flew, after we flew, after we started flying again, uh, we had to put in a total of 33 missions over over Germany, and my last three was over Berlin, and I wasn't real happy with that. But we knew we were just about to finish, but there, somebody had the idea they were going to finish us off before we finished. Berlin was a a very tough target, and each one of those tar flights into Berlin and back was 10 hours. And so when I finished my 30, when we had finished our 33rd mission, somebody felt like that was enough. So we didn't have to go up anymore. And uh, Can you tell me about one of those flights into Berlin like you say, it was towards the end of the war, Your la one of your last missions. What uh, did you see? How did you feel? And they, they, we, were, we were, were, were not happy with those flights. In the first place, having to go to Berlin. In the second place, having to bomb Berlin. Uh, they didn't bomb Paris, and uh, therefore there wasn't any many people lost that way, civilians. But Berlin was different, and one mission we were on, I can't remember which one, our target was a tea garden gate. Now, uh, that's the middle of town. And uh, I we never felt good about that, but there wasn't anything we could do. Uh, that was just our, our particular target. And uh, they were massive attacks. The one attack I know of that we flew of the three targets, three times we would have been in, there was every, I think probably every possible plane uh, stationed in England was put on that flight. Uh, one thing that I can remember is it was 10, it was a th 300 miles, 500 miles.
from some point in England to Berlin. 500 miles back, 600, 600 miles. Mm -hmm. And where I was sitting in my plane, where I was in my plane, I could see a row of, of B-17s, B-24s going this way, and we were going this way. It was full of planes, and that's what helped get in in Berlin. But when we got back from there, it was all fine. We got back, made it fine, and we didn't have to fly again. No. Now you told about the time when you actually got shot down, and was there any other circumstance where you felt like this is it? This is. Did you feel more, even more threatened on any other mission? Uh, I think I felt, I think I felt worse on other missions, but this mission I was so busy. If if any if we didn't get done what had to be done, we wouldn't gonna make it. So we had to get these all this uh, weight thrown off the plane. They had to get it flown, or they had to fly it, and I think that kept us busy enough that we weren't looking for, we didn't panic. Yeah. Uh, other planes, like at the time, when we went over Germany, over England, Berlin, and the different places around there, uh, the anti-aircraft fire and enemy aircraft fire was so bad that it looked, it looked like it was over. You just thought, sure, your time was coming. And we had different people on our plane get hit by shrapnel, but I never did. During all of this time, were you able to stay in contact with your family? No. You never, had no letters or never, communication? Uh, we never had any contact with our families at all, but we could write letters and I wrote letters to my family, uh, and I don't remember when or how, how many, but our letters were not sealed. And so we, our letters were taken to the post office, and from the post office they went to somebody to read it. And if they read something that wasn't supposed to be in there, they cut it off. So every letter that I wrote home had been uh, something done to it, you know. So, uh, I, uh, when I was on this flight in front of France, uh, we, my children and I, knew an old lady in the, in London, whose whose husband had been killed with gas in World War One, and we got to be good friends with that old lady, and and. Uh, talked to her quite a bit, and evidently somewhere I had, she had my folks address in Belton, Missouri, and uh, when I was, when I, when we didn't show up to her house, her apartment, when we supposed to, what she thought we would, and then we didn't show up, you know, for another 30 days, she wrote my folks a letter and said that we had showed up to her house and she knew something was wrong, but she felt everything was all right, that we would make it. And uh, we did. And that helped my folks consider considerably because they had already gotten a letter from the War Department, whoever, with the missing in action. And, uh, no, no information for so long a time. So my folks had already planned a church, uh, a, a church thing for me when they got her letter. You you thought you were in fact missing in action for a while. Then? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. That was they, after that plane went down. Is that yes, yeah. yes. They had us missing in action. We were we were doing we were walking at night and in in getting into toward Paris. We weren't missing an action actually, you know. Uh, 
we had uh, every German that I saw was dead, laying in a ditch. So, when did you actually hear that the war was over? When was it over? Over? Uh, I came back across the Atlantic in a little boat, and it took 14 days to get to New York City. And I went into a camp in New York City, and they sent me on a plane, train, and sent me to Kansas City, Missouri. My folks lived outside of Kansas City. And I got into Kansas City the morning that Harry Truman was making his uh, VE speech. VE speech. Because I could hear that on the, on the, in the Union Station in Kansas City when I got there. So, uh, and I can't tell you what date that was. I, I've forgotten. But it's very important. Can you tell me about your homecoming with your family? Okay, I I came home. They met me there at Union Station, and I came home, and I think I had two weeks. And, of course, I got to meet everybody around and all the family and talk with them and everything. And my dad had been in World War One, but he had only been to... Fort Riley, Kansas. He was young enough, he didn't have, he never got overseas. So I took it upon myself one day to tell him about a flight or two that we'd had and what it amounted to. And he looked at me and he said, are you sure? He had trouble believing it. Huh? So, so anyway, I decided then I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say more, <laughs> and uh, I definitely, definitely never mentioned the ghost, ill face. Yeah. Throughout uh, throughout your life, have 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 you been able to share with with people your experience? Have you pretty much kept it to yourself, or how have you handled I what never, you went through? Outside of telling him about a little thing or two, and he asked me that if I knew. I, if I was, if I knew that was true, I, I decided then I never, never talk. I never talked to anybody. I never ever told my wife a cent a thing that uh, that was uh, that was overseas. Uh, she too about things that happened in the United States, United States that didn't amount to anything, you know. But but I never told her anything. I never told any of my kids anything, and I I was remarried in 1985 to a young lady, and in 1987 there had a, there was a reunion for my bomb group in Tampa, Florida. So we went to this bomb group meeting, and. It was a big hotel, and we opened it. We went into the room where a bunch of my, my crew members were standing and waiting, and they all started hollering, pale face. And uh, my wife could, couldn't understand what in the world was going on. And so then they, they told her the whole story about pale face. But she was the only one in my family that ever heard anything about my uh, time in Europe. <laughs> so, and I didn't, and I wasn't happy with that. But uh, since then, I have met other people, and I went to the uh, place in Omaha or uh, D.C. about four years ago, and I was with two other guys there, and we started talking about different things. They happened to be in the inf infantry, talking about different things, and I still know those guys and hear from them every Saturday, and we still now talk about different things. But uh, that's all been new to me. I, when I got out of the service, 
I was through with the service. I didn't have any more to do with anything like that. And that's the reason I was so sure that I never spoke about it. Yeah. Now we've, we've been in a lot of conflicts, our country since then. Briefly, can you kind of describe how you feel about the kind of situations we find ourselves in today? Uh, they're horrible. I, if I had to say something that I really mean, we didn't fight that kind of fight. We had a different kind of war. And I feel so bad for these guys, so sorry for them, because not even the, to me, not even the general public is for them or with them. They're out there doing a the job on their own. And I think in World War II, there was a hundred percent help, work, people together, where they don't, I don't think we have it today. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to be there. And currently you live here at, at the Veterans Home. Um, are there other things, other places, other things you'd like to accomplish in life at this point? You know, do you well, have any have any wishes at this point about how to spend your time? I, uh, I did several different things. Uh, after I got out of the service, I went to school and uh, I got a degree in veterinary, veterinary medicine and I practiced medicine in a little town out here, uh, Central City. Central City, I was there 32 years. And uh, then I sold my practice and I went to work with the USDA. And I was with the USDA then until 1942, 1982, 1992. And we moved to uh, uh, in Arkansas. And uh, we both uh, done some of the real estate work there, and which was really a lot of fun. It was uh, a thing, uh, if I tried to do anything, I think that was it. And I enjoyed it. And uh, we got along real well with that. And my wife passed away in uh, 07. And in 012, in 12, I uh, fell and had a stroke. And uh, it's been kind of a, a bad deal since then. But uh, I'm alive and still do some of the things I like to do. Yeah. I really appreciate you talking with me today. Before we close, just one last time, if there's anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to to say, this is probably a good time to do that. I, I don't know of anything that... Uh, I left out of probably a lot of things, but uh, I'm so happy to have done that I went in the service as an 18 year old boy that knew everything there was possibly to know and didn't know anything when I got out. So uh, I think that's, I think the service showed me maybe the difference between an eight year old boy and maybe a man. And there's a lot of things that go on after a man that you probably wouldn't have thought of when you was 18. And so I'm real happy. I'm happy that I got to do the service. I wasn't injured. I had uh, I had a lot of fun in times, and I had a lot of things that, uh, a lot of bad things at some times, but I made it through and I was very happy for it. And uh, and my, ha my family didn't suffer anything, so. They weren't hurt either. Uh, okay. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for the ability to, to let me come in here like this because I, I am just overwhelmed with your, your understanding.